Okay, so now um, I'm just going to go into, uh, I'm, I'm going to wrap up pretty soon, so you can all go home. Um, but I thought I'd just go through some practical applications of all this. The, the neat thing is that this idea of presence matters because once you know the physics of how it works, you can calculate how to make better sound. You can calculate you know, what you need to do to make better sound. So the first experiments that Longy already talked about, this is an experiment at Holy Cross in Worcester, uh, which I did last year. And th this was a shoebox hall. It's 100 feet long, 40 feet wide. There was an organ at this end that went away. The instruments played here, and the audience sat here about 30 feet away. You couldn't hear anything. I mean, it was just, woo, 2.2 seconds reverb time. Actually, I, that's what Kevin Altachi said it was. I measured two. I'm actually rather confident of it's two. Well, OK, I got a chance to redo it. And I made it into a theater seat seating kind of thing with the audience surrounding the musicians in the middle of the long wall, one of the long walls. And these panels overhead are not reflectors. They're four by eight fiberglass. Okay. What's the point? If a hall is too reverberant, what matters isn't the reverberation time. Reverberation time is beautiful. We know that. Go to Boston Symphony. Okay. The problem is it's too loud. And it comes too soon. That's the problem. Well, if you do something to absorb the first order reflections as close as possible to the musicians, you've made the reverberation come later. You've also made it softer. And you haven't changed the reverb time very much. Or you don't have to have done that. So anyway, so we added these <coughs> curtains here. And we added these absorbers over them. And we moved everybody around. And it opened last month. And they love it. So <laughs> I made a review of it in the intelligence so you can read about it. Um, I did the same thing in, in Bucknell with, with Frank Cunningham. This was a 1,200 seat concert hall. Um, it's 40,000 uh, cubic meters, approximately. Um, and it also had, a, this one really did have a 2.2 second reverberation time, empty. And you can see the stage completely bare, hardwood. And the president likes to come out and address the whole college um, from the front of the stage here through a PA system, which has a speaker up here and a speaker up there. And you can imagine what it sounds like. You can't really understand a word. Uh, and they weren't happy about that. So, and, but the other thing was that you could have a little orchestra here or a string quartet or something. And more than about here, where I put the arrow, no, about there, whoops. Um, you could no longer hear the string quartet clearly. It, it, it bl blended into that fuzzy ball. Now, the way I knew that is, is I have this little technique that Tapia Lopki, who you should watch Tapia Lopki, he's really, really hot. He invented this, this electronic orchestra. So I have his electronic orchestra. You have set up a loudspeaker array that duplicates the directivity of a string quartet, say. And then you play anechoic recordings through each speaker. And it sounds like a string quartet. It really does. And then you can do the trick. You can walk back and say, oh, it stops right here. This is where you lose it. So it's really great. Um, anyway, we found that it, it, you lost it about 2 thirds of the way back on the floor. But then they had curtains that the architect had supplied for drama performances. I said, put the curtains on. So we put a big back wall curtain on stage and a proscenium curtain over the front of the proscenium. And believe it or not, it was clear all the way to the back. And the balcony cleaned up, too. So that was wonderful. I just communicated with him. They're all very excited. Um, they are using the curtains. Um, and they're very happy with it. Um, and they want to make it work for rock concerts. Well, I have a, uh, the, but the bass, of course, this doesn't do anything to the bass. It's still two seconds. And you do a kick drum at two second reverb time, you know what happens. Don't want to do it. Um, so it, you have to low, lower the reverb time. Anyway, they're, going, they're thinking they're going to install Niels Larsen's, if you don't know Niels Larsen's, you should. He's a wonderful inventor in Denmark who's invented a way of making air mattresses as absorb bass. And you can hang these things from the ceiling. And if you suck the air out of them, they're not there acoustically. It's like they went away. And you pump air into them, and you can adjust by the air pressure how much bass they absorb. Isn't that cool? It's really cool. And
anyway, they're not very expensive, and they're broadband observers. So they, they're probably going to do that. Um, what's this? Jordan Hall. Jordan Hall had a valence once across the top, and in 19, what, 60, 1995, Larry Kierkegaard said, out with this. And it's been out ever since. And when that happened, there was a hue and cry among the musicians that played there, saying, oh my god, put it back. Hall has gotten impossible. Um, well, Lee Eisenman and I got together this summer and rehung the uh, proscenium curtain. And here's my little electronic orchestra down here from Top Yolipke. And we, we made recordings in this hall. We put, cur uh, we put blankets out to try to emulate a, a half full audience. And we found that, that in this hall, without the curtain, you lose the localization in about row O. Interesting. No, row O. Oh, it's gone by O. It's row I on the floor. Where is that? Well, I don't have it in the picture. What about the extra stage you've got there? Does that affect? This uh, part. I mean, oh, this one. Yeah, yeah, that, that's yeah right. Um, that isn't going to affect our experiment. Um, it was there. We had to, we had to use it. Right. Um, then there's Sanders Theater. Somebody replaced all the seat cushions with the original, which were velvet over horsehair, and were a standard of absorption used by Sabine <laughs> to do all his experiments, with these atrocities, which are hard vinyl over foam rubber. Hard foam rubber. And they're sound reflective, of course. This is why this now has a 2.4 second reverberation time at 1,000 hertz when it's used as a lecture hall. And they complain about the sound system. Guess why? <laughs> yes. Do you know when the seats were changed? About 1974 is my best guess. David, uh, were the balcony seats always there? No, they all had horsehair. Oh, there too. Oh, oh, absolutely. That's where yeah, the, that's the area. There. <laughs> it's way up there, and, and and there's a lot of area up there. Yeah. And and uh, I went back to some of my early recordings. I was a recording engineer from what, 1964 up to 1980, probably 1980 when I kind of quit. Um, so I have a lot of recordings, and I I found out that full hall up there you could get as low as 1.2. Yeah, I in seconds. Um, and and at my guess is with nobody in there, it was probably 1.4. I have a I have recording I made with uh, Winston Marcellus, who sold out the hall. Um, mm -hmm. recent, that was last year. And um, it was very reverberant. Um, it was well over. Um, it was up around 1.9, even with the audience full. I'm, I'm trying now to get into classrooms, because this whole business of presence, I think, is really important in classrooms. So I recorded this, uh, lec this uh, lecture, actually not that one, another one. His name is Logan McCarty, uh, the one I recorded. He's a physics professor. Um, and uh, uh, I was sitting back here. This is a bowl shape, and there's a big horn up here, multicellular horn. And all the students in the back row were, were not listening. And, and the sound was loud. I mean, you could understand it, but you didn't want to hear it. Blah, 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 you know. And, and they were all playing with their cell phones and talking with each other. And that's the norm these days. No, it's not. Because if you go to the middle of the hall, they were listening. And in the front of the hall, they maybe were really they, listening. Maybe that's why they're sitting in the back. <laughs> well, the, the, they're self-selected. I completely agree. But the reason they weren't listening up there is because, the reason they were talking anyway, is because the sound was so loud, they had no compunction not to talk. Okay. If the sound was softer, they wouldn't talk. I'm quite sure. At least that much. So I recommended to, to Logan that he drop the microphone. He said, if you drop the microphone, the students in the back will move forward, and they'll get better guidance. <coughs> but anyway, I have this way of measuring it. There's, I made a measure, which is basically looks for how, much, how peaky the sound is. Okay? And so I plot the peakiness of each syllable for the different positions. So this is microphone, uh, no microphone in the front of the hall. You can see it's very peaky. If you have non, if you have then the dielectric constant, the static dielectric constant. Okay, it's very present. All right. If we go to the rear of the hall with no microphone, it sounds like this. We're going to do Gauss's law, and the introduction of Gauss's law will be. It's still very good. It's just softer, and you can hear the background noise. Uh, in the front of the hall with the microphone, that's very good. With the negative charge, it seems to point towards the negative charge, and again, though, it's always pointing. Well, it's nasty sounding, but it's clear. Okay, so the cellular horn is doing something there. 
Although I, you clearly don't need it because this is so much better. If you have non, if you have then the dielectric constant, the static dielectric constant. Okay, and this is the rear with the microphone. Even though the whole molecule is electrically like neutral, very important water has the separated distribution. Finally, we'll it's, it's exciting the re reverberation by that. <laughs> oh, yes, it's really beautiful. Uh, here's some impulses respond Boston Symphony. Um, this is where Harriet and I see row, set row R, C11. Um, <laughs> now there's a place to sit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is row DD, C11. And you can see the C80 values, and I'm not going to play these. I'm not even sure they're going to work, because I, I don't remember making them work. Um, uh, but the point is that both C80 and IAC C80 predict the opposite of what we hear. <laughs> OK. So that, so that what, basically, C80 is no different. They're the same. Um, IACC um, in DD is 0.2, and in, 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 in this good seat, it's 0.68. Now, I would say, well, that's good. You know, that's great. IACC is actually telling us something interesting. Except you look at all the literatures, and they say, this is what you should have in a concert hall. If it's this, it's a bad concert hall. Right? So this is a bad C. Right. Could you explain what CAD and IC? Oh, CAD is the, uh, if you sum all the energy in the first 80 milliseconds, and you compare that to the total energy, that's CAD and dB. OK. And what it's saying here is that, that C80, in this case, if you, go, if you integrate 80 milliseconds and compare it to all the rest, they're about the same. Okay. And here you see, this is C50. This is showing 50 milliseconds. And that's, that's different. Okay, it's a little shorter. It's just different. But again, the books all say that C80 should be this value, um, or, or it should be low. And, and so both seats pass this C80 thing. This is my LLC measure. And you can see LOC says, oh, 9.1 dB. That's fantastic. That means very high clarity in row R. And in the row DD, it's minus 1.2. And that's not good. This is the diagram. We don't have to go into that again. Um, oh, oops. Let's forget that. Oh, this was talking about, I, I was talking about this with uh, Eric Larry Kierkegaard. I said, why is the DD bad? And why is the, the, the front row of the first balcony so good? Because they're about in the same position in the hall from the orchestra. And he said, oh, well, that's because there's more reflections in the, in the front of the balcony. And I said, well, look at this impulse response. This is row TD. This is what's coming off that sidewall into row, into that C. And, and the question, and what happens if you take that out? Like, what if we, we absorb that? He said, oh, it would be too soft. You need that reinforcement of the sound from that re sidewall reflection. So we tried it. <laughs> it doesn't change the tempo. It just makes the presence suddenly pop. <laughs> There's suddenly the orchestra's in front of you. Take that out, bingo. It's just as loud. Why is it just as loud? There's so much energy in all this stuff, which I didn't grab. How'd the loudness is in the reverb. It's not in the first order reflections. How'd you get rid of it? Oh, you do it with this an impulse response. You just <coughs> took it out. And then you convolve it with some appropriate instrument. Listen, these are binaural impulse responses, so you can do that. Here's a little rogues gallery, and then I'll quit. Um, excellent venues, Epidurus, Teatro Cayo Mendizo, front row of First Balcony of Boston, Satsover Berlin, Jordan Hall, at least in the front, uh, before and after <laughs> renovation. Uh, um, there's an Epidurus. What about it? I don't have to talk about it. There's good reasons it sounds so good. Um, this is the Spoleto Teatro Cayo Meliso, which is where Scott Nickerns directs a music festival every summer. It's in Italy, obviously, in Spoleto. And it's a small Italian jewel box opera house. And he says, this is the perfect place for chamber music. It's, you can hear every instrument, everybody can see, they can hear. It's gorgeous sound. And this is what he said he wanted at the Calderwood Hall in Boston. So that was, he had a picture of this, which he gave to the architects. This is what I want, he says. You'll see how that came out. Boston Symphony, of course, is great. Don't have to talk about it. You all know. Scott's over Berlin. We've talked about Jordan. We've talked about that. Uh, Bayreuth, I don't have time to talk about that. <laughs> Vienna, what a great place. And the Met HD. Wow, that's really good. <laughs> um, Here's a bunch of, of dogs. 
and you probably know them. This is Avery Fisher, Carnegie Hall. Um, what is this? Oh, Disney, of course. Yeah, we um, <laughs> this is the new hall in, in Copenhagen. This is, no, this is Copenhagen. This is, uh, is, is Helsinki. This is the Sala Sinfonica in Puerto Rico. Um, this yeah, is uh, the uh, Gewandhaus Leipzig. The Schiller Theater in Berlin. Um, I have binaural recordings in most of these places, and you can listen, actually, to them. And it's, not, it's very revealing, actually. This is the new Oslo Opera House. And this is the Calderwood in, in the Carter Museum. Uh, is that the Philharmonie? Uh, what, this one? Uh, no, the one more over. Uh, this one? Yeah. No, it's not the Philharmonie, because the Philharmonie has all kinds of little thingies hanging. This is the new Copenhagen um, oh. concert hall. It's built by uh, Toyota, again, who did Disney Hall. And it's a Disney Hall clone, and it sounds just as bad. Um, anyway, OK. Let's, let's just take a little like bit more look at this. Um, lower, right? this. This is Disney. Um, this is Helsinki. This is uh, Copenhagen. And this is Leipzig. All of these halls violate rule, concert hall rule of thumb number zero, which is don't put audience behind the performers unless you have a lot of seats you can sell to tourists. <laughs> that works for Disney, because there are a lot of seats you can tell, sell to tourists. <laughs> However, Helsinki in winter. How about that? I know. They're it's wonderful. The choir <laughs> <It's the> choir <laughs> Never mind. These seats are always empty. Why do you have one? This is the uh, Leipzig Gewand House. Again, too many people behind. It's not great for other reasons, too. Right. Here's the Calderwood Hall. Scott Nickrens had requested the hall resemble the Theatre Kelm. In Lizo, this is what he got. Half the audience is behind the musicians. There's a glass window that prevents anyone in the balconies from hearing the direct sound, unless they lean uncomfortably over the rail, at which point vertigo sets in, or a tired back, I'll tell you from experience. <laughs> or they fall over. Women in the balcony should not wear dresses. <laughs> How can you make so many things wrong and call it a concert hall? I don't know. It's very, it's very bright and clear, though, don't you think? Not if you're in the balconies. I think it's awful. Where what do you think place? of the floor? The floor is OK. It's not great. And the reason it's not great is that you get a corner reflector off each one of these, these balconies. And they're 360 around. So the clarity is, is there, but there's a lot of early reflections. More than you should have. In the garden museum. Yeah. This is Carnegie. Carnegie used to have a proscenium curtain. Boop, across the front here. Isaac Stern took it off. It's been lousy ever since. I won't go further. Avery Fisher. Stage house is too large, too deep, too reverberant. Instruments not on the four stage are muddy before you even hear them. That's the same problem as at Longy was before we fixed it. Have you ever sat up close on the floor at Avery Fisher? It's pretty. Pretty good, pretty cool. Yeah. I agree. The first third of it, I think I say here, yeah, clarity is pr yeah. clear or non existent for seats more than a third of the way back. Yeah. yeah. There's always good seats in the hall. Actually, in Helsinki, they're very hard to find. Um, but they're, they're easier to find here. But most of the people get very little. Mm -hmm. Apparently, going to be rebuilt with current practice, it's unlikely to sound any better. <laughs> Are they changing the internal dimensions at all when they rebuild it? I have no idea. It'll be a new building. It'll be a new building. I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, I think the problem there is primarily that this, this stage box is so reverberant. There's, and and they, uh, Artec put in all these little reflectors, which help a little bit, I have to say. They help a little bit. But it's still a big reverberant box. And if you're out in front here, I have recordings of this, incidentally. You can listen to them. The instruments in front, you can hear. The and that was, I was recorded from about here. Anyway, you get some fun, you can hear it. All everybody in the back is a big mush. They hang drapes, heavy drapes on the back now. They do. So, yeah, yeah. I've seen I that actually two, on the I TV. Went to two concerts there. Big, thick things. So, I mean. Well, are they thick? Because I wasn't sure looking at the television picture. They didn't look thick. They look thick. I, I didn't go up. Okay. So, we should find it out. But it's different from. But you see, I would I would recommend they do that. Yeah, That's yeah, like yeah, yeah. what we did at Bucknell. Yeah. If you put yeah. if you put drapes across the back wall, it'd be a different place. How does the valence help? The valences which you've been espousing, I mean, they're, the they're, they're up toward the front of the 
I frankly don't know. <laughs> but the reason I think they're important... They're not covering the organ in back. I mean, no. Well, there's no organ in the No, no, I meant at, at joint. So, well, six, they were six, there six. for as long as the organ has been there. Yeah, they no, but I meant they're right at the edge of the stage, right? Yes. They're, they're, yes, right in front of the proceeding, yeah. actually. So why do they work the way you were... It'd be nice Sitting if they were far in the back, right? I don't know, but they do. We measured it, we found out that it does. Mm -hmm. And... and I, I, I'm guessing there's a good reason for it because it was a, a universal feature in every vaudeville stage. Right, right, right. And there was a reason for that, or they wouldn't have done it. Well, it does damp. I mean, anything that's going up. It damps what's something. going. It, it it has to at least do that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's going to change the direct to reverberant ratio because right. all the shit that's in the stage house is going to, some of it is going to get absorbed before it yep. goes out. Yep. And there's a half a dB can <coughs> make an enormous difference. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's why. <coughs> So here's the uh, the uh, the uh, 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 the uh, Holy Cross Hall before we rebuild it. Let's see how low. Looks like that. Sorry, guys. I'm spending too much time. No, no. This is <coughs> all right. Anyway. Oh, this is Williams Hall again. This is a big cube with very little absorption, and they use it for concerts all the time where nobody shows up. Okay. <laughs> the sound is gorgeous. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Because the piano is surrounded by curtains. What a fine idea. It records nice too. I like that. Conclusions. Three, three, ISO 3382 analysis for clarities are based on obsolete theories of hearing. The evolution of the ear and brain demands direct sound be audible. Current hall designs are turning live performances into spectacles for tourists, driving audiences to music movies and recordings, which have amazingly good presence. Current classroom design and sound reinforcement strive for loudness over engagement, understandings, and remembering. And the Greeks knew better. <laughs> That's my answer, I guess. Is that good? Wow. Yes. Thank you. Good. Good. Yeah. Of course. The questions are allowed and encouraged, actually. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> Fortunately, they've been asking them all along. Yeah. What's up, Alvin? Uh, what's interesting, Dave, you're always throwing out everything we've already known, always known about previous <laughs> hearing and et cetera. And, and it was only you, you didn't fail us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad. It's the same <laughs> score. But back when you said something about this early reflection from the side, when yeah. you were showing the impulses, yeah. didn't help? What are you telling me? What are you saying there? Oh, let's go back. Let's go back to the that that slide, because it's a wonderful slide. Um, I got the opportunity to measure all these things, and, there you and, go. and, and it was just a wonderful thing to be able to have. I, I, I got a, a little Genelec 1029, it's actually Harriet's, <laughs> and I, I did a bunch of frequency sweeps from basically the conductor position in all my favorite seats, both good and bad. And so, so anyway, this, this, this reflection here is a sidewall reflection. Okay, so this is row, um, uh, row DD seat 11, um, and, um, and, and so it's fairly close to a sidewall. It's not in the middle of the hall. So um, anyway, there's another one, and I don't know what this one is. It probably has something to do with the stage. Um, but the point of this is, if you, if you go look at the, the LOCs, where's the LOCs? There they are. All right. This is, the, this is the level of the direct sound in, in the one, in this one, okay? You can see the direct sound, in row R, the direct sound is very strong compared to the early reflections, right? So that, the LOC thing, you have this, the direct sound, you have, you have to think about this impulse as being convolved with a note. In other words, you're gonna put a sound through there, and this, this peak here is gonna get extended through through by the by the by the sound of the note, okay. So it, it length it, it goes for the whole length of the note, that peak. And during the, when the note hits these, energy starts to build up, and as it moves along here, the energy builds up more and more. Okay. But this is constant. So that's just what this 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 curve is showing here, is that the level of the direct sound is constant, and as the note builds up. The, the reflections build up. But you can see that the energy that the ear is getting, this is the energy at the eardrum, basically, is mostly direct sound. Okay. 
So it's very easy for the, the ear to say, oh, that's the direct sound. I can localize. Everything is fine. But over here in row DD, first of all, you have this enormous reflection that comes. And that pops the whole level of the reverberation up very soon after the direct sound. So that raises the whole level of this curve. Notice that this is very shallow here. Here it goes bingo, and then it goes up. All right. But the direct sound's much softer, of course, because you're far back in the hall. And there's many, many more reflections coming. Okay. So ultimately, it builds up to there. Now, the loudness in these two seats is pretty much the same. Because by the time this gets through building up, it, it's gotten pretty loud. Okay. But the clarity is, or the presence is very different because in this one, the, the ratio of the area under the blue line and the ratio <laughs> to the, ratio of the area under the red line is minus 1.1 dB, which means there's more un in, under the red than there is here. Now, the reason I made 100 milliseconds is because those comb filters I'm showing you, nobody knows how long they really are. I don't either. But in this diagram, I'm assuming they're 100 milliseconds long. I'm not convinced that 80 wouldn't be a better number, but it really doesn't make much difference for this kind of argument. So what's happening is the comb filters are integrating energy over a 100 millisecond window. And they're saying, at the onset of a sound, the comb filters say, ah, good, we've got good <laughs> peaky sound here, so it sounds present. And oop, on this one, no, I really can't tell much. So that's why it's different. Now, if I erase that, if I erase that peak by just deleting it from the impulse response, then this whole curve drops down. Instead of doing this, it does this. Does it look like the other one on the left? No, it's because this the direct sound is so much higher. Mm -hmm. it, it, it would probably go from minus 1 to, minus, to plus 2. In fact, I think that's what it does. I did it. Yeah. Um, do you think that impulse that uh, the uh, on, on DD, that one, the nasty one, mm -hmm. do you think that could be a reflection off of the first balcony down into? It's it's probably that, because the the side wall is to some degree blocked by the people sitting there. Yeah, it's yeah. further away. Yeah. Whereas this is fairly tight. Well, and it, it directs it's, out coming. Well, it's, it's a corner reflector. The the balcony is here. The side wall is here. Sound hits here hits the sidewall, hits the ceiling, and goes down. That's what you see. Yeah, because I was thinking of the ledge of the first balcony also being close, you know, coming this way and down. No, no, no. It's off the sidewall to the under, under balcony ceiling mm -hmm. into the hall. That's where you get your, most of your energy. Okay. Now, in the, in the, in the Copenhagen, new Copenhagen Opera House, I mean, it worked in the old one. It was beautiful. <laughs> then they made this big, huge one, and, and they did just really stupid thing. They have these balconies, and they have corner reflectors on the under surface of the balcony. A corner reflector with respect to the sidewall. And now imagine you're sitting in the in the orchestra, and the in the orchestra seats in the, the stalls, and you have the orchestra in a pit there. Well, the pit orchestra, what happens? Sound goes up, hits the balcony ceiling, hits the sidewall, hits you. But you can't hear the direct sound from the orchestra because they're in a pit. They're in the pits. So what do you hear? There's the orchestra, and there's the singers. <laughs> really? I, I was there with Larry Kierkegaard, actually. And, and he got seats on one side. I got seats on the other side. We were sneaking in when somebody left, you see. So it was sold out. Um, and uh, uh, I got about a third of the way in. And you got about a third of the way in on the other side. We both said, orchestras over there or over there, depending on whether your mm. side you're on. Um, was it like, it's a, like a bad, a bad PA. It's a, it was a bad PA. It didn't actually sound that bad, but um, you couldn't hear the singers. You couldn't hear the singers. I, I made a vinyl recording and played it for Eckhart Kehle, as you know, it's German. And he listened to it and said, I'm German and I can't understand the words. <laughs> Yes, go ahead. In a home listening room environment where the room dimensions are pretty small yeah. and the speakers are just a few feet away from the sidewalls, right. do these same phenomena kick in or is it no. entirely different because the reflected sound and the direct oh. sound are so close? The, 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 that's a very good question. The question is, 
how close does a reflection have to be before it messes, or how far away does it have to be before it messes up presence? And the answer is, you can calculate that. Because you know, say you have a fundamental frequency, say my frequency is 125, roughly. It goes up and down. <coughs> um, and you want to have a reflection with a sufficient time delay so that, say, at 1,000 hertz, you have the 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th harmonics okay, sitting there in a critical band. All right, you want to have it so that a delay is sufficient that when it hits my ear, it affects this harmonic slightly differently from that one because there's a delay. And you can calculate um, what the delay has to be before this one and this one are interfered with roughly 180 degrees. That turns out to be about five milliseconds. That's all. That's all. You get seven milliseconds pretty effective, 10 is very effective. Okay. So if you have your speaker within two and a half feet of a wall, the reflection is probably beneficial to presence, or at least it doesn't hurt. Now, you can do this experiment. That's easy to do. In fact, when Larry and I were in Oslo, I, I went to Michael Schoenewald saying, I'm in Oslo, get me a ticket to Siegfried. So I can't. So that's sold out. Even I can't get a ticket. Oh, let's do that. So I went to the rush tickets down at the ticket office in the center of Copenhagen and stood in line. And I got the last three tickets because Larry said, get one for me and get one for my wife. So nobody else at the conference, it was a conference of the Institute of Acoustics, was interested. <laughs> <laughs> so I got these tickets, and they were the last three tickets to sold. And we were right in the very highest balcony, right up against the back wall. And it was pretty good, because that reflection off the back wall is in phase with the direct sound, and not so much. And underneath the balcony, the reverberation is reduced. That used to be Ozawa's favorite seat. And, and the frequency response there, there because it's all, I mean, the warmth of the low end is all increased. It's very nice. That, yes, it's very nice. Yeah. And I had the same experience in Schlossberg. I don't know if you Schlossberg know Schlossberg and Brandeis. Never heard a good sound. Never heard a good sound. Yeah. Sit in the last row against that back wall. Yeah. It's Turn pretty it. damn good. Yeah, there's another advantage there. That's when the ceiling is closest to your head. Yeah, but it's not that close in Schlossberg. David, in a domestic room, do you sit? I mean, the speakers two, three feet, whatever, uh, might be good. Do you sit back toward close, uh, within five feet of the back wall? No, no, I never do. No. You in stay fact, up in the middle of the Yeah. Room. Well, five feet, you hear a comb filter off that wall mm -hmm. in, in a hi-fi situation. Mm -hmm. Because you hear a comb filter when you have a point source, OK, and it's bouncing off. Of, then you get, you get an interference. If you're listening to a broad source, lots of instruments playing at once, the comb filters, you just don't hear it. And, and you, 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 you don't. But the room does not, for you, does not decorrelate enough. Uh... I, I, my room where I listen to music is very dry. I mean, I have carpets, I have rugs on the wall, and I have bass absorbers in the corners. And uh, um, I liked good imaging, and I want to be able to hear exactly where every instrument's yeah, coming from. So, yeah, with the imaging. Uh, so. The distance from the back wall of the loudspeakers does not, it's, the early reflections are now 5 to 10 milliseconds. Is that enough for good depth imaging, depth gauging? I don't know anything about that. I'm only calculating presence. Yeah, right, and, right. And, and how you get depth imaging, I really don't know. Because in my experience, the presence effect in terms of, of distance is binary. It's either, it's either there or it isn't. Mm -hmm. And there isn't a gradation. And I know that when I mix a recording, I think I'm having the illusion of depth, and I think I can control it. I'm not sure that I, that is really true. I don't know a physical mechanism in hearing for hearing depth. Um, there might be a frequency response effect. You maybe could do it with, with filtering. Um, but you know, ambience in the lexicon unit was designed to, to make a, speak, a, a singer sound not in your face. And it works. It really works. You know, you have a close mic, and you add these reflections, which vary from about 30 milliseconds to about 90 milliseconds or so, plus a little reverb. It really does move it away. 
Um, and it doesn't seem to be as binary as I get in these concert halls. That basically, I'm saying there are things I don't know. So I don't know. I'll, I, I have a wonderful vinyl recording of the Boston Symphony from the front row of the first balcony, looking down at the orchestra, and uh, <coughs> it sounds. All the instruments sound close, and they all sound equally close, and they all sound equally beautiful, in my opinion. Either I don't sense any feeling of depth. Now, on the floor in row R, I'm, I'm very unhappy, basically, they're not using risers, because I find the woodwinds sound a little bit more muffled, and, and I don't like that. Um, so I don't, if that's depth, I don't want it. Well, I'm not, okay, I mean, that, well, that's a specific complaint. I, I, would, I sort of disagree with you because let's say in Sanders Theater where I see the, the uh, orchestra, the, the stage as being relatively wide and shallow. Yes, it definitely is. Uh, essentially, I don't sense any depth. I mean, that makes picking up the woodwinds or the microphone easy. It certainly does. It's but, a joy. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, don't, uh, I, I don't sense. Uh, I don't sense that depth that we're talking about. Yeah, and I love it. Um, so I think that might be a matter of test. I don't want to hear that. I want to hear every instrument with the kind of clarity that, that it should have recorded for 20 years in Jordan Hall uh, with cantata singers. And, uh, and I have to mic the chorus, which is always in the back. And if you don't mic them carefully, so as not to pick up too many of the other instruments, um, they always sound like they're on the moon um, compared to yeah, uh, the other instruments. Well, Jordan has and a fairly deep. It's the deep, and, and so, um, and if I was, I have done this also, if I'm recording a situation where um, I do want to get some feeling of distance between the front row of an orchestra and some of the woodwinds, then I will separately add a little bit of reverb to the, to the middle of the orchestra. And as I'm saying, it works for me, and I'm not sure I'm just imagining it, I'm not sure, um, but it seems to do something useful, and I don't know why. It's a matter of taste. Do choruses on Jordan's stage, do they go back to the wall, or do they? If, if David Hoos is conducting, they sure do. Really? <laughs> yeah. To get, um, but the, to get support, to get bass? No, she just likes it that way. Right. Uh, there's no acoustic reason for it, as far as I know. Steve, they, do you have something to say? have much room. Yeah, right. They, that's all the only place you can put them. <laughs> and the same is true in symphony. I mean, that's even though it's the, in, in <laughs> Carnegie, when we were, we, we just went down the side of Carnegie, uh -huh. the chorus is, uh, the chorus risers were uh, six, eight feet at least from the back wall. I see. Mm -hmm. Symphony Hall, we right up against it. Well, you want to get, you, in stage. Carnegie, you want to get everybody you possibly can out of the stage house. You know, you just get them closer to the audience. Do they have the drapes in Carnegie? No, the drapes are gone. No, no. That's a pity. Oh, no, I'm at Avery for something. Yeah. Um, the hall that I've been hearing a lot of stuff in lately, and I'm sure you have a lot of exposure to also, uh, is first congregation. Oh, God, yes. What a mess. What's wrong with that room? Why is it as awful as it is? And, and I find <laughs> that's the most remarkable place. By moving three rows forward or backward, you either are in the middle of an experience or, or you're somewhere out of, the, else. out of the experience. Of the country <laughs> life, yes. and, there's, and there's no sh there's no nearby reflecting surface. About ten years ago, they completely they redid it redid it by redid reducing it. as <laughs> they took out as much absorption as they possibly could. I don't know if they changed the seat cushions. I think they did. Somebody, in fact, told me, and I've forgotten exactly what they did. It was extensive, and I said, "Why <coughs> did you do that? It makes it impossible for music performances, except on the organ." Well, I gave, just gave a talk on organ acoustic. <laughs> yeah. That organ works because of the very high directionality of the, of the casing and the way the pipes are put in. It's very right. flat case, right. little projecting little boxes, and, and organs with their incredible amount of upper harmonics. The, the, the presence thing only works in frequency range about 1,000 hertz up to about 4,000 hertz. You have a lot of stuff that's happening above there. It sounds present no matter what you do with it. Okay, so the organ yeah, organ's cut right, right through. It just through. Well, it, it, it can, okay. But that's what an organ is. That's yeah. what it's supposed to do. Um, but I said, look, you do that, you, you won't be able to hear the preachers anymore. That you could ruin the hall for speech. I said, oh no, we put a very expensive sound system. It works great. The speech always uses a microphone, and you can hear it. Well, okay, fine. 
um, an, an experience that I had just before going to give the lecture to the uh, local section of the, of the uh, physical society. That was a couple weeks ago. Um, I was with uh, Anna Azima, and we were looking for, she's the director of Boston Camerata now, after Joel Cohen. And she's got beautiful ears. I mean, I'm, she, she's very good ears for listening. That's what I meant. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and she's also a wonderful singer, of course. And um, so we, we were going testing different halls, trying to see where we might be performing. She wants to do the play of Daniel um, next year. And I said, we've really got to go listen to Trinity, Copley Square. She said, oh, it's too big. Well, I talked to some of the people I knew at Trinity. Do you have small concerts in Trinity? Yes, we do. Um, it works really very well. I said, and we've got to go. So uh, we went, and we went to Trinity. And I, I had a picture where I was going to put it in the slides, and it didn't get in, sorry. Um, but it's a beautiful picture. Well, I could put it on the computer, I suppose. Well, skip it. Um, I don't know if you, you must know Trinity Church. It's an absolutely gorgeous space. It's huge, gorgeous space. So I went up on, on where you went, might perform and sang, and then she did it, and I sang. And I had my avatar there, and we, we recorded all that. <coughs> But it wasn't necessarily recorded. She knew exactly what I was talking about. She walked back and forth and says, you lose it about here. That was almost 3 quarters of the way to the back wall. Wow. And that's a lot of seats in Trinity. OK? And so we experimented going empty. different places in the chancel. Huh? And this was empty, too. It was, it was empty. empty. Yeah. Right. Wow. And uh, we, this is gorgeous. We uh, tried all kinds of places. I sang from the balcony. She listened, all that sort of It works. And I sang from the pulpit. And the pulpit is fantastic. You get this incredibly bright sound out of there. Um, and uh, so we were packing up to go, putting away Sonari. And uh, uh, um, a man walked in, and he was wearing a dog collar. So um, <laughs> that turns out to be Patrick uh, Ward, who is the head of the sanctuary, the, the clergyman in charge of, of the, the church. And I said, we were just singing, and it's so wonderful, this place. It has this incredible clarity. And, and, um, and I, I did this little lecture. I said, you know, I turned around, and it's very different. And in this church, you can be up there in the front, and you have this intense feeling that you have to listen to the person who's talking. I said, do you use microphones? He said, oh, yeah, we always use microphones. Do you ever not? Yeah, when, a, when the system breaks, we use it. It works fine. <laughs> I said, yes. You really ought to try yeah. what happens if you don't. He said, well, you know, this, this church was built as the speaking platform for Brooks. What's his name? Uh, Phillips, yeah, Brooks. Phillips Brooks, who was the rector there for years. And he said, this was his pulpit. Okay. And you could hear him everywhere. Right, I said, exactly right. And then I said, you know, they, the Sanders Theater was like this too until they removed all the, the seat cushions and put in the reflective ones. And so was Memorial Church in Harvard Square. They replaced all those seat cushions, too, um, with sound reflective ones. And, and Ward said, oh, they've been telling us we were having to do that. I said, don't dare. These things are treasures, what you have on those seats. Horsehair with velvet. Uh, by the way, many people here know the Newman Hall at BBN and the building it was in, and the hallway which had a say by, I mean, had a cushion in it. It's all gone. It's all torn down. The cushion is still the there. Thing. No, the cushion's over at Ascentec, I think. I'm oh, the cushion's sure. in Ascentec, yes. But anyway, the building at Newman Hall, oh, in which it was very dry, but it was yeah. for speech, and I mean, all that's all level. Uh -huh. All disappeared off the face of the well, anyway. name of Jerry. Terrible. Yeah. Well, anyway, that's my experience at Trinity. Trinity is a fantastic place for presence. It was, they did everything right. So, so is she going to do the play of Daniel there? Depends on too many factors. Who knows? But it, it would be nice if we could. Yeah. When audience sits behind a uh, orchestra in some of the round uh, things, that must have some of the <coughs> ameliorative effect you were talking yeah, about. It does. I mean, it's absorbent. It's yeah. those below 500. The minutes. difference between Kennedy Center in Washington and in uh, and and Avery Fisher in New York is the audience in the stage house, and the difference that it makes is about three dB in loudness. Yeah, it goes down below 500 hertz, I assume. The yes, audience absorption. The audience is absorbed yeah. pretty low. That's but, right. Yeah. When Boston Symphony, the, the stage house, has an organ, that whole area is basically absorptive. Organ pipes are very absorptive. Are they? Yeah. 
Right. They're all Humboldt's resonators. Yeah, no, but I, yeah, I was saying all the shiny, just shiny surface for the trouble. Very good question, and I don't. That's what. That's something I, I. I'm hoping that I can get some students at RPI to model that. The, the, it's a very complicated question. Yes. How does sound go through uh, these pipes? Because it's sort of a double horn, yeah. um, and and I, that's the kind of thing you'd want. Uh, what's his name? Well, a lot of things. Are, I mean, a huge <laughs> oil painting, you know, is shiny and and floppy. reflects treble and also lossy in the mid range and so on. So, I, I I would like to know how sound transmissive are organ pipes. I think they're less sound transmissive than people at Fisk think they are. Mm -hmm. I would very much like it if they would space the organ pipes a little bit more that would be widely. Cool. And, and I talked to Steve about that, and he said, well, we might do an experiment. We could take out half the, the show pipes and see if the organ sounds different. I said, yeah, that'd changes be really the grid, cool. Huh? Changes the grid big time to have it not be. Well, the, the problem with making an organ like the one in Mem Church is you, you, somebody has specified you know, 10,000 stops, mm -hmm. and you've got to figure out where to put 100,000 pipes, yeah, and know. there's not much space. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Also, with people are used to, if you had an old west, if you had all the pipes three inches apart, it would look completely right. different. Old west mm -hmm. works very well, and the reason is the pipes, the pipes don't fill the boxes which they're in. You know, there's space between them, but there's space above them too, right. and it's it's open in that sense. Hmm. Uh, and and you know the the uh, the Rooks positive in in Old West has got this incredibly wonderful gritty sound. Mm -hmm. It comes right through. No, it's very present, not enough bass. Very present. Oh, well, then I'm not so sure about not enough bass. <laughs> oh, no fists have enough bass. Huh? No fists have enough bass. <laughs> oh. You just want to keep turning up the. You haven't heard the new Memorial Church organ played by Christian Lane. No, that, that has a, too much that bass. Is, no, that's tubby. No, you're right. No. No. It doesn't it's have still, to be tubby. It just is the way he plays it. It's the only one. <laughs> okay, we should stop talking. Thank well, you. Well, no, if there's no. more questions. Okay. Want, or if you want to hang out. Okay, come one on. More, one more. Okay. Oh, the John, well, that one's why, why does your green laser leave a red tail when you move it? Well, that's a very good question. <laughs> so that may be the reflecting surface. Oh, that's not it's so bright. Exactly. No, I think I think it's yeah. Certainly, it's it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a it's a retina effect. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's it's knocked off the, the green sensors. Well, the red eye, the red eye light thing when you take a picture. Yeah, yeah, well, it's, that's a, no, it's true. It really does. Yeah, he's right. That's wrong. It's a very bright laser. Yeah. Can you pop balloons with it? Huh? Can you pop balloons with it like they do on YouTube?